Perfect. Welcome to the webinar series uh, with the Marine Environmental Education Center located in Hollywood Beach, Florida. Uh, we are still closed, um, so we are continuing to do the webinar series and we will continue it next month as well. Um, today we have Glenn Goodwin, a uh, local hero. He is the outreach manager for the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. And today he's going to be talking about um, the end of sea turtle nesting season, give us a recap of what happened this year and compare it to other years. So if you guys have any questions while he goes through his presentation, please feel free to type it in the chat. He will get them, he will get to the questions at the end. And Glenn, if you are ready to go, take it away. All right. Well, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as Carla mentioned, I'm with the Broward Sea Turtle Conservation Program. I'm also a PhD student at NSU as well, uh, where I study sea turtles, uh, as you may have guessed. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that project uh, as well towards the end of the, our talk today. But I do welcome any and all questions about sea turtles. I know a decent amount, uh, but uh, you know anything you want to throw at me is, is cool. Uh, and um, if you find one I don't know, that would be even more fun. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So Broward County is a... Uh, nesting beach for sea turtles. So we do get a few species of sea turtles that nest here. So we get the loggerheads, the greens, and the leatherbacks on our beaches. Um, the, because sea turtles are endangered, uh, their nests have to be monitored. So different parts of the county or different parts of the state do that a little differently. But here in, in Broward, we have a lot of beach cleaning. We have a lot of tourists and stuff on the beach. So we have to mark off all the nests and make sure those don't get run over by the big beach cleaning tractors. People don't stick their umbrellas in them stuff like that. And so and NSU has the contract from the county to do that. So we do all the sea turtle monitoring here in Broward. We monitor about 24 miles of beach. So everything in Broward except for the state park, uh, Mizell Johnson State Park, uh, we're responsible for. So we're a medium density beach. We get about 3,000 nests a year. So this uh, beach we're looking out here is actually up in Broward County. So this, or sorry, up in Hillsborough. So this is our kind of densest beach. This isn't with all the nests on it quite yet. It's somewhat early in season. But you can see, if you look closely in the middle, uh, one of the local predators of sea turtles, uh, especially the hatchlings and the eggs. So there's a little fox there in the middle. Uh, so they will get in and dig into the nests and get to the eggs and stuff. But don't worry, I was there that day. I scared her off and was the hero we all deserve. So our program, uh, is kind of made of several different crews. So on that, we have the morning crews and they're the ones that go out and do the daily nesting surveys. So uh, we're out there March 1st through October 31st every day, marking off new crawls, monitoring all the nests that are out there, et cetera. So you see here in the top left, one of our sea turtle specialists out there after marking off a fresh crawl. We also have a couple crews that go and work at night. And that's mostly to help with hatching disorientation. So here in South Florida and Broward, we have a lot of light pollution and that impacts both the hatchings and the moms. So sometimes the hatchings will crawl the wrong way looking for the bright uh, horizon over the ocean. And uh, sometimes they, get in, they can get into streets, things like that. So we have a couple crews out there. And one of the main tools we use is a restraining cage. So if you look at the bottom left, there's one of our night crew with a, a cage. So this Cage is not for predators. So this isn't gonna keep out the foxes, things like that. What they're for is if the hatchlings come up and crawl the wrong way, they'll get stuck in the cage. And then we monitor those throughout the night uh, to make sure those hatchlings get safely to the ocean. Uh, we also have a lighting crew that goes out and surveys all of the uh, beaches in Broward uh, every month and looking for areas where there's a lot of light spilling out on the beach. So I report that to local code enforcement to see if we can get rid of some of that light pollution. And then of course, we have to collect scientific data. So we are a organization that believes in conservation through data. So we work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. We give all our data to them. But as you can see up here in the top, uh, a couple of our brilliant scientists out spreading uh, the research that we've done here uh, with us at a conference, a sea turtle conference last year. And of course, we really love sea turtles. They got us jumping for joy. So a typical day for one of our morning crew sea turtle specialists starts pretty darn early. So we're out there about half an hour before sunrise. 
and we go ahead and get started driving our ATVs along the high tide line. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking for crawls. So a crawl is any uh, time or the tracks of a sea turtle where she crawled up out of the ocean. So we're looking for those crawls of those moms. So we find a crawl, we're gonna follow that up and determine if she nested or not. So if she nested, we'll mark it off. Like you see this leather back nest here, we'll use pink flogging tape, uh, stakes, and then we'll put uh, some identifying uh, numbers on there so we have some information about it. And we'll monitor that throughout the season. Another thing uh, we check for are times when the turtles don't nest. So this is what we call a false crawl. So about half the time in nature, um, the mom's gonna come up out of the ocean looking for a place to lay her eggs and she's gonna turn right back around. So sometimes it could just be, she doesn't like it there. She might run into a rock, be like, this isn't great. Um, or she'll see a predator, things like that. Or she's just checking it out. But here in South Florida, we have a lot of tourists that come and they spend all night on the beach. So they go and try and party with those moms. Those moms just wanna lay their eggs. They're not interested in partying, so they'll turn right back around. So we actually have uh, typically more false crawls than we do nests here in Broward. We also respond to any strandings that happen in the county. So a stranding is just where a sea turtle washes up that's sick, dead, or injured. Uh, so if it's sick or injured, we're gonna work with our local rehab partners. So the main one we work with is Gumbo Limbo Nature Center up in Boca. So we'll take this, the turtles there to their hospital, their sea turtle hospital, and they'll get them the help they need to get them back in the ocean where they belong. Another thing we'll do is relocate nests that are in danger. So sometimes mom comes up and lays her nest in an area that is not a great spot. So we used to really relocate all the nests, but now we only uh, lay the ones where they're in bad areas. So uh, there are kind of two main criteria for us that we say, oh, bad nest, mom, let's move it. So uh, one is if it's in an area with high erosion. So this nest was here on the beach uh, in the intercoastal. So a lot of that sand washes away. So we relocated that nest. Also, if they lay their nest below high tide line. So as the tide comes up, when it goes back out, there's that smooth sand. Sometimes the mom doesn't crawl far enough, doesn't get her, lay her nest out of that area. And so every day that nest will get washed over. So we'll also relocate those nests. And of course we get to deal with hatchlings. So uh, we pull uh, hatchlings out from uh, different things that we do. And we usually release them at night through hatchling releases in July and August. So one question we often get on the beach is how do we know a sea turtle nested? That's because sea turtles go through the same nesting process each time and they leave us several clues to let us know what they did. So the nesting process begins when the mom comes up and does what we call body bed. So she'll kind of uh, look around, find that perfect spot of sand, uh, scuttle down, get all that dry, loose sand out of the way and get to the hard packed uh, sand. So then she's gonna use her rear flippers to dig an egg chamber. So this egg chamber can be anywhere between a foot and a half, three, four feet deep, depending on the species. Once she's done with that, she's gonna uh, drop all of her eggs into that chamber. So for a loggerhead, she can lay anywhere between 80 to 120 eggs. Uh, the green sea turtles can lay up to 160 eggs and leatherbacks, which are the biggest species we get around here, uh, can lay, uh, actually lay the fewest. So they're laying about 60 to 90 eggs in each nest. So once she's done with that, she's gonna pack the sand back down over the hole, and then she's gonna scoot forward and camouflage the nest using her front flippers. So she'll dry loose sand, or throw uh, dry loose sand back over the area. So it's in hard to find out where she dug that hole. And once they're done with each of these processes, we have a nice sea turtle nest. So fortunately, each species does that whole process a little bit different, and so, we are able to see what kind of turtle laid the nest. So I'm gonna go ahead and give y'all, or teach you guys some of the uh, signs that we look for to tell what species laid a nest. So we can actually tell by the way they crawl and stuff, but there's also a bunch of uh, important key features we look for when we're determining the species uh, when a nest has been laid. So starting uh, with the loggerhead. So the loggerhead is the most common uh, nest we get around here. Not about 95% of our nests come from the loggerhead sea turtles. So when we're out there and we see one of these, what we're looking for is this small fluffy mound. 
So this mound can be anywhere between eight to 10 feet in diameter, a foot and a half or so tall, and somewhere in there a couple feet down are the eggs. So that's how we know if a loggerhead nested. For greens, we're looking for a much different indicator. So what they leave us is this giant grenade explosion in the sand. So this giant hole, uh, the, the green turtle will dig whenever they're camouflaging the area. So when they're using those front flippers to throw sand behind them, um, they create this giant hole and you can see that big spray area. So that is the mound on green turtles. So anywhere in that 20 to 30 foot in diameter uh, spray area is where the eggs are. And then the leatherback, the biggest of all, definitely makes the biggest mess out there on the beach. So just like all the sea turtles, they do have a nesting mound, but instead of just a fluffy pile of sand, they crawl all over the darn thing. So what they'll do when they're camouflaging is they'll throw some sand behind them, scoop forward, throw some sand behind them, turn, throw some sand behind them, and just keep on doing that and crawling everywhere, uh, creating these huge pits or uh, nesting mounds that could be 40 foot wide, and somewhere in there, five to six feet down are the eggs. So leatherbacks are definitely the best at hiding their eggs from us. So I hope you all are paying attention because now I'm gonna uh, see if y'all can identify what species laid a nest and what kind of crawl it is. So let's go ahead and get started. So feel free to um, type your answers in the chat or if you want to uh, unmute yourself to answer, I think that's okay too. We'll see what Carly says. All right. So first off, what kind of nest do you think this is? All right, so we do have a couple uh, people weighing in. Yep, all right, everybody was paying attention. So this is a green sea turtle nest, very good. And we can tell because of that giant hole right there. All right, how about this? This one's a little trickier. All right, so we got a guess of the leather back from Jennifer. Uh, Jose saying loggerhead. Uh, all right, Celeste, sounds like you've done something like this before. So yeah, it is a false crawl. So this is a loggerhead sea turtle false crawl. Uh, so she came up and she didn't nest. I told you a little tricky. So she actually just came up, didn't do any digging and turned right back around. So she's actually still in that smooth sand below the high tide line. So she probably uh, was just coming to check things out and decided she didn't like it and went back. So when they false crawl, they don't actually like just give up. They'll usually uh, swim about half a mile or so north or south uh, before they try again. All right, how about this? Hey Jennifer, good to, good to see you, glad you came. Uh, yep, uh, so le logger, leather, and we got another vote for loggerhead. So yes, this is a loggerhead nest, and we can see that small fluffy mound. So this one's uh, kind of the more typical sort of style that we get the nests in the morning. So instead of being nice and textbook like that one we saw earlier, this one's been rained on, people have walked all over it, kind of police ATV is driven by. So this is usually what we're dealing with. So it's definitely much harder to tell sometimes. But she didn't crawl all over it like a leatherback might have. So she just nested and then went right back to the ocean. Good job, everybody. All right. So once we uh, find that nest, identify the species, we'll mark it off. And then we'll keep monitoring it until it hatches. Once it hatches, uh, we'll mark it again. And then a few days later, we're going to dig it up and do an excavation. And for that, we do, or when we do that, we do an inventory. So we count everything that's in that nest. So we pull all the eggs out, all the eggshells, um, and then we take measurements, and then we put it all back. And you might wonder why we want to stick our heads in those smelly holes, and it's for the ever great pursuit of data, right? So we're just a bunch of nerds out there playing on the beach. So we really want to know what's happening. So one of the kind of interesting bits of uh, data we get from this is the hatching rate or the hatching success of the eggs. So how many 
eggs hatched for nests. So in a regular nest, an in situ nest, so that's one that we didn't do anything, we just put our stakes around it and left it alone, we usually get about 75 to 95% of those eggs are gonna hatch. So out of 100 eggs, that's about 75 to 95 of them will hatch. Uh, now for the relocated nest, only about 68 to 88%. So once we relocate it, that hatching success drops down. So only out of that 100, only 68 to 88 are gonna hatch. Now it's not because we're not good at it. Uh, we do have a lot of training. We do it semi-frequently, but we're just not as good as mom as picking the, the perfect area, digging the hole just right. And so the hatching success is usually a little lower. So that's why we only really locate the nests that aren't gonna do well, that might get washed out or get washed over a lot. So we also get the opportunity to rescue any live hatchlings. So the, it's a group effort to get up out of the nest. All the hatchlings usually hatch out about the same time and they have to work together to go up through that couple of feet of sand to make it to the surface. So if a hatchling uh, hatches later than its, its brothers and sisters, it's gonna have a really hard time getting out. And so when we dig up the nest, Sometimes we'll find those little stragglers and we'll keep those. And so those ones uh, we will release at night. And in July and August, which is peak hatching season uh, here in South Florida, we'll actually do hatchling releases with them. So we'll take them out at night. Uh, we'll invite all our friends so uh, uh, the public can come out and we will uh, have their kind of start to life at that time. So we'll release them to the ocean, let them crawl out and get into the waves. So I'll tell you how y'all can find out about that a little more later. So of course, here are all the hatchlings we have here in Broward County, except for one. Does anybody know which of these species doesn't nest on our beach? Good job. Seems like y'all have been uh, paying attention to the other uh, meat talks. So it is the hawksbill that doesn't nest here. But we say that, but occasionally we will get uh, hawksbills, maybe once every few years, uh, one that gets lost. But it's really hard for us to tell the difference between a loggerhead nest and a hawksbill nest because they crawl the same, they make the same style nest. And also, um, they look pretty darn similar. So when they're all covered in sand, we can't really tell the difference. So we mark the nests off uh, just the same uh, either way. So we don't try and do any genetic testing or anything to find out. So the loggerhead is the most common, uh, we said, uh, that we get around here. So this is the smallest of the, the hatchlings that we'll see, also the smallest turtle. And so they have these uh, three ridges on their back and they also have kind of this brownish color and they have that hard shell uh, from the time they're born. So their carapace, that top shell is hard uh, as soon as they come out of that egg. So the biggest species we get is the leatherback. So even as hatchlings, they're much bigger than their loggerheads, than those loggerheads. So uh, they don't have hard shells. So leatherbacks have that name because they have a thick leathery carapace instead of a a hard shell, so they have that too. And they have these big flappy front flippers and they're usually a bit darker than the loggerheads. And the last one we get is the green. So this little green hatchling, uh, the way we tell the difference is by their colors. So they're, they're gonna be darker. They're gonna be almost kind of greenish black. And then they're gonna have these light edges to their shell and their front flippers. And they're gonna be just a little bit larger than the loggerheads as well. That's how we tell the difference between each of these species. So of all the hatchlings that make it to the water, how many survive to adulthood? What percent? All right, we've got one guest. Less than what percent Celeste says, Erica is saying 10. Yep, so unfortunately, Celeste is right. It's only one out of a thousand. So not even 1% will survive to adulthood. 
that's because these little turtles have a lot to deal with throughout their lifetime. So they can get, uh, they have to face predation. predation. So unfortunately, uh, hatchlings are bite sized for pretty much everything out there in the ocean, all the fish and things like that, seabirds, et cetera. But also as they continue to grow up, there's a bunch of human threats that they have to deal with. So commercial fishing, they can get uh, caught there. They can get caught by peer, uh, on piers by hooks, um, dredging, all sorts of things they have to deal with as they try to survive. So as you go through odds or life, may the odds be ever in your favor, tiny turtle. So how many nests have we gotten? Well, we've gotten a lot, gosh darn it. So out of the past five seasons, we've actually had three record seasons. So things have been doing pretty darn good around here. So 2016, 2017, and 2019, we set some records and some uh, sub records too. So if we, uh, just before I get into these, these include that state park uh, counts. So just kind of Keep that in mind. If there's a two to three hundred nests each year in the state park. They get added to these numbers. So for the loggerheads in 2016, we had 3,400, and then 28 to 2,900 in 2017 and 2019. But that 3,400 loggerhead nest that was the record in Broward County for the most loggerhead nests we've ever gotten. So that was pretty darn cool. Now the greens, uh, the numbers look quite different, right? So. 95% of our nests are coming from the loggerheads and only five to 10 from the greens. Now you'll see that these numbers change a bit, right? So we have 137 in 2016, then we have 665 in 2017. So with green sea turtles, uh, with all sea turtles, they don't come back to nest every year. Usually it's between three to five years between seasons. But for greens, they actually usually come back every other year. So we'll have a low green year like this year, uh, 2016, 137. Then a high green year, 665, 2017. 2018 was a low green year, no records there for anything. And then in 2019, we had a phenomenal year for greens, 787. So that was also the record number of green nests we've ever had. And then we have our leatherbacks. So less than 1% um, from the leatherbacks, no records there, uh, a little smattering of them, but Leatherbacks don't really nest around here. Most of their nesting is up um, or is throughout the Caribbean. Also, they get quite a bit of nesting up in Jupiter as far as Florida goes. So this brings us uh, to the grand totals of about 3,500, a little over 3,500 for 2016 and 2017. And our all-time record of 3,641 uh, total nests in Broward County. So 2019 was also the record season for Florida in general. So our trends typically follow the Florida trends. Sea turtles nest pretty, um, uh, pretty similarly throughout Florida, some areas more or less, but the numbers go up and down about the same. So let's see how we did this year. So I mentioned before that those other numbers included the state park numbers. These don't, we'll get those at the end of the season. We'll get a couple, two to 300 more nests than this. But without further ado, loggerheads, about 2,500. So nowhere near that record 3,400 that we got a few years ago, but a pretty fine number. And then we had a low green year, as we expected, about 235 nests. So that's just fine. And then a nice little smattering again of the leatherbacks, about 28. So all total, we had 2,828 nests in Broward County this year. So once we get those state park numbers, we'll probably be up around 3,000 to 3,100. So not a record-breaking season, but much better than it used to be 20 or 30 years ago, where we might have gotten 500 to 600 nests per year. So we're definitely doing a lot better and really coming along. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you all about is a separate project, and that is the NSU sea turtle tagging project. So this is something uh, that is done just for research. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what's going on with the moms that come onto the beaches. So that uh, morning, the nesting program has been around for about 30, 35 years, so since the mid eighties. And so we know a heck of a lot about all the nesting in Broward County. We know about you know, how many nests we get, you know, the, the trends, uh, and things like that. But once the moms come up, uh, once they leave the beaches, we don't know anything about what they're doing. So that's kind of the goal of this project is to look at them. 
And this is through the CMED lab. So this is under Dr. Derek Burkholder, and it's the Conservation Movement Ecosystem Dynamics Lab here at NSU. So what the heck are we doing out there? Well, we're tagging turds. So what we're doing, as I mentioned, is working with the nesting females. So we're not tagging the hatchlings at all. Uh, we're just focusing on the moms and we're just working on the peaches. So uh, the males stay in the water and the, the juveniles and, and the younger turtles also stay in the water. So all we get is the nesting moms. And we are tagging the loggerheads and greens because those are the most common ones around here. So on this picture over here, we have a green sea turtle in our box. So, so far we've tagged 163 sea turtles over the past few years. So pretty darn good. We were hoping to tag more this season, but as you know, there were some complications uh, and so we weren't able to get out there as much, but we did pretty well. So we're doing a couple different things. So we're putting ID tags out on them. So uh, there's a couple different versions we use. So we use flipper tags, which are little metal clips that we put on their front flippers. And those you can look at and you know, if uh, another researcher finds the turtle, they can check that ID tag and then they can you know, reach out and see whose turtle it is or who tagged that turtle originally. But a lot of times those fall off. So we'll actually also put pit tags on them. Uh, so those are like chips that you would put in your dog or cat. So we put that in their flippers and those can be scanned. So if another researcher scans the turtle, then they can find that as well and contact us that way too. And we also put satellite tags. So right there in the middle of the picture on her, or the kind of top middle of her shell is a satellite tag. And what that is doing is tracking her movements after she leaves the beaches. When she's on the beaches, we can see that too, but we're most interested in what they're doing when they leave. So, so far we've tagged about 20 of each species, or we've tagged exactly 20 of each species. So 20 loggerheads and 20 greens. So 40 total, uh, moms we've been following around since they left our beaches. So our real question is what are they doing out there? So sea turtles, uh, when they come to nest, they don't just hang out right off the beach. So they don't live here. The sea turtles that nest here don't necessarily live here. So typically a sea turtle that say lives down to the Keys, uh, they'll start at uh, the beginning of the season, maybe March, April, if it's a loggerhead, and she'll start swimming up towards Broward County. So once she gets here, she's going to nest, she'll come on, lay a nest, and then she'll go back out into the water. Now she'll lay three to five nests per season, and she won't go all the way back to her foraging grounds during that time. Instead, she'll hang out typically close to Broward, and, and that's what we call their internesting period. So she'll kind of just swim up and down the coast. Uh, usually don't, they don't go much further than Jupiter. Usually they just kind of stay right off Broward, but we have seen some other movements too. And then she'll come back, she'll nest again, lay another nest, go back out to the ocean. And then once she's all done nesting, she's going to migrate back to her foraging grounds. So back to where she came from. Uh, and then she'll stay there for two to five years, uh, depending on the species, depending on the turtle, before she comes back to nest again. So we're trying to figure out just where the heck they're going. So, uh, so far, like I said, we've looked at a bunch of each. So for the green sea turtles, they're not actually going very far. So you can see that for most of them, they kind of, they nested and they hung out really close to shore. Again, someone went up to that Jupiter area to, uh, in between nesting and they came back. And then most of them went on down to the Keys. So either the dry tortugas or uh, down around off the coast of the Everglades. So not swimming too far, but that's still uh, a couple hundred miles uh, total swim between where they came from or uh, between those foraging grounds and their nesting grounds here in Broward County. So not a bad uh, little travel. You do see this one sea turtle here uh, that went down, was kind of headed towards Cuba. Uh, we don't know where she was going. Unfortunately, we think that she got uh, on a boat uh, at that point and then went to Cuba. So uh, we're actually pretty sure that sea turtle got poached because her uh, tag stopped reporting right there, or it got picked up, moved to the coast of Florida really, really fast, faster than a turtle can swim, and then stopped reporting. So unfortunately, we think we lost that one. Now the loggerheads do a whole lot more moving uh, than the green turtles. So you can see our loggerheads come from all over. So we have a bunch that live throughout the Bahamas, 
Uh, but then we have some that live off the coast of the Carolinas. So way up there off Cape Hatteras. Uh, then we also have a couple that have gone over off the coast of Mexico. Uh, this is the Campeche Bay right there off that Yucatan Peninsula. And they live over there. So some of these uh, swims are short, maybe a couple hundred miles, but these long ones can be 1,200 or so miles. So that's a lot of swimming uh, for those turtles between the, their foraging grounds where they live and then where they come here to nest. So if we look at all of our turtles, we can see that there's definitely some different patterns. So you might wonder what's the point of all this? It's really cool, right? To know where they're going, things like that. But sea turtles, as we mentioned, are endangered, right? So we have to be able to protect them wherever they go. So if we're doing all this, uh, investing all this uh, time and effort with the nesting program to protect the turtles, the nests that uh, are laid on our beaches and make sure those stay safe. But if the bombs go somewhere, they're not protected, then that's not really uh, gonna help too much if those moms don't come back. So by figuring out where they go, we can work with kind of regional partners. So we can work with the different islands throughout the Caribbean and Bahamas and make sure that the sea turtles are protected wherever they go. And that's all I have for you. So here's a, a green sea turtle. So this is Peggy Ruth, one of the turtles we tagged uh, a couple years ago, making her way back to the ocean with a nice satellite tag. So she lived off the, just north of the Keys. All right, so we do have a couple questions here in the chat, I think. So I'll go ahead and get to those. And you guys are feel free to ask any other questions. So Jennifer is saying, why do we keep a separate count from state parks? And so to measure their protection. So the state parks, because they are the state, um, they do all their own counts within the kind of the state property. Um, so they handle all of that. So that's why it's, it's done separate. Um, they're classified separately as well, but for the most part, the state parks take care of all the, the beaches there. All right. Uh, and then, let's see. All right, so Ashley's asking for opportunities to get involved. Well, Ashley, uh, there's my email there. So uh, go ahead and uh, shoot me an email and we can talk about the, all the things NSU uh, does and ways you might be able to work with us. All right, does anybody else have any questions? Can the public sponsor a satellite tag? Absolutely. So you can actually follow all of our sea turtles um, by going to turtletracking.org, which I somehow did not put on the, on the thing, but I will type that in the chat here. So uh, turtletracking.org, that has all of our uh, sea turtles on it. See so the satellite, the ones with satellite tags, so you can follow them there. A couple of them from this year aren't quite working yet, so forgive me about those, but there's 31 that you can check out where they went. Uh, and so, yes, uh, there's also information on there on how to sponsor a tag. So that would be very helpful because uh, satellite tags are kind of uh, expensive. So we would appreciate any and all uh, sponsorship for those. And also you get a chance to name the sea turtle. Uh, and so that'll be on the site as well. So you get to be able to follow your turtle around. All right. So um, Eric is saying, how long did the satellite last? So how long did the satellite tags last? So the satellite tags can actually last five, six, seven years. The batteries in them can last forever. And the, but the main issue is that the turtles uh, just aren't kind to them. So we put them right in the middle of the back uh, where they are semi-protected, but sea turtles really like to rub on rocks, uh, coral heads, things like that, especially the greens. So they often knock them off uh, within just usually kind of our shortest reporting time is anywhere between three to eight months. But we have had a tag that's been reporting for two and a half years. Um, but another issue uh, we have is that stuff grows on them. So we call it biofouling, but things like algae, barnacles, stuff like that will grow on the tag. And eventually if it gets enough on it, it will stop working. So it can, it can last a while, but it just depends on how well she takes care of her new accessory. All right, so Morgan's saying that uh, sea turtles can see red light. They just don't pay attention to it. 
how true is that? Um, so it is kind of true. So sea turtles aren't sensitive to red light. Uh, so most sea, or most animals that live in the ocean don't really use red light. And that's because as light goes into the water, it kind of splits up, right? And the first wavelength to get absorbed is red. So that long wavelength light uh, gets absorbed by the ocean. And so past about 10 to 30 feet, there's really not any red. So there, there's no red down there. So it's not something that they look for. Or, and a lot of animals in the ocean can't actually see it. So sea turtles are less sensitive to that. Um, and so that's why at night we use those long wavelengths, those ambers and red colored lights when uh, working with uh, the turtles. Now, if it's really bright, um, they can notice it, but they're more sensitive to the blues and the green lights. So it is a bit true that, you know, if it's, it's real light, if it's bright, uh, red, if it's, but even though it's red, uh, they can still see it. So that's why we only use those red lights out there when we need to. Otherwise, we're mostly just wandering around in the dark. All right, and so uh, Jennifer is asking about a socially distant turtle release. So yes, uh, we actually have, well, uh, kind of. So we've been doing these uh, virtual releases each year, or this year, this uh, past October. So we do have one more tonight. Uh, so if you uh, guys join us again at uh, 5.30, if you uh, go to our, our Facebook page or Instagram, here, I'll pull that back up, um, you can join us for that. Uh, some of the information will be the same, but there's a lot more in depth about the nesting uh, here in Broward. So if you check us out at, at Broward Sea Turtles there, um, you can find out more information about that. All right, uh, also at the Broward Sea Turtles, so I mentioned earlier that we do live hatchling releases typically uh, every night of July and August. So next year, hopefully we're all able to hang out again. Uh, and uh, so that's how you will find out about that. So you sign up, you kind of go get a, a little talk and then we'll take you all out to the beach and we'll release the turtles and you'll get to see that them crawl into the ocean. So it's a pretty darn cool experience. All right, so Jennifer is saying you've seen videos of turtles with barnacles or clams attached. Uh, so, yeah, so I have seen those videos online where people are, are popping those things off the, the turtles. So the, that's kind of a, a natural thing for barnacles to grow on turtles, especially loggerheads. They carry a lot of them. Greens will get them too. It's mostly the loggerheads and it's, it's pretty normal. So they, the ones that we see out there nesting, the majority of them are going to have barnacles on them. Some will have more, some will have less, but it's usually not that big a deal. It does become an issue if the turtle gets really sick and they don't move for a long time and then they'll get a lot of stuff growing on them. Uh, so in those instances, just popping those uh, the barnacles and stuff off isn't necessarily helpful if you just release the turtle. Usually there's something else going with going on with the turtle and it's really sick. So it's best uh, that those animals don't just get released, they get taken to a sea turtle hospital to get the care they need. And also to have a professional uh, pop them off because it is, it's pretty hard to do that. Uh, you can damage the, the shell uh, if you do it wrong. But if they just have a few barnacles on them, it's just fine, just leave them be. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, well, if anyone does think of any questions um, after this presentation and you really wanna know, you can shoot us an email, uh, meek at nova.edu or you could email Glenn, there's his uh, contact, his personal email right there, or just the general Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program email address is there. Glenn, thank you so much, that was awesome. Uh, nice to get a recap of how the season went. I know a lot of people were asking us um, how it was going through the last couple months, so really cool to get some numbers. Um, we are going to be continuing the webinar series for the month of November. We are finalizing our schedule. So check our social media pages in the upcoming days for a new link, same setup. So it'll be one link, a reoccurring one for the month of November. Uh, so keep an eye out at Seek the Meek for our Facebook and our Instagram pages. Uh, to next Tuesday, November 3rd at 3 p.m. We're gonna have Sophia Ringel who is the founder of Clean Miami Beach, and she'll be taking uh, talking to us about how all of us can help save the planet. So thank you guys for tuning in. Glenn, thank you again. 
Um, we hope to see you guys next week. And everyone, have a great day. Enjoy the weekend and stay safe. Bye. Bye.